Hey everybody and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Today, um, today's going to be a fun webinar, I think. What we've done is tried to put together a sort of a compilation of utilizing different light shaping tools. Now, for my way of thinking, there's basically two camps here. There, there's two different uh, areas of coverage for light shaping tools that we need to talk about. For me, it's broken down in soft boxes and reflectors. And, and what, I, what I mean by the soft box is not just a soft box like a medium soft box or a small square, but that could also encompass uh, octobanks as well. And on reflectors, not just the small reflector head, but that also could take care of a pan head or uh, a magnum kind of a looking piece, uh, a beauty dish. All of those things kind of fit within that category of light shaping reflectors. Now, for me, I utilize the soft boxes more often than not on people, uh, in portrait and photography, in fashion, uh, executive headshots, things like that. But also, I will utilize some of those reflectors on faces as well. So let's just make sure we know sort of which tool was best, is best used for which sort of usage. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that all through this, it's all about opinions. And you guys, get to, you guys get to choose how you use these tools. But all of these different light shaping tools have a right to exist. They are all good at one or two or three things. And that's why they've been developed. It's like umbrellas. Uh, umbrellas, umbrellas are terrible at trying to, trying to control light in a small white studio. But if you need to light 20 people, an umbrella is your choice. It's the best way to do it. So all these different light shaping events, these, these tools have different have different rights to exist. They all, they're all have, a, have a good, good use. So let's start off by, by going over a soft box just by itself in the studio. And then we're going to come back. We'll talk about a little bit about that further and we'll take some questions. So stick around. Here's about a three minute piece on working with a soft box in the studio. Hope you enjoy it. And, and again, thanks for joining us. You know, when it comes to light shapers, probably the most used tool out there is a medium sized soft box. It is a great portrait light. And, and with good reason. It does a lot of things pretty well. Um, in this case, I'm going to use one, just a medium soft box by itself uh, for this first shot that I'm doing with Gabby. So let me just get this shot set up here. Gabby, go ahead and let's just turn you a little bit away from there. That's it. And bring your head back this way. Good, right in there. And let me just bring this around just a bit. Okay, let me just fire off one or two here real quick. And we'll take a look. Great. Great, great. Chin down just a little bit. That's it. Good, good. Okay, good. So with one light, with this directional like this, it's pretty deep on the shadow side. Good, good. So Serena, let's go ahead and just bring in that reflector. Bring it in kind of forward a little bit. There you go. But let's not cover her up too much. Go back. And now come in a little bit closer to her. Right there. Perfect. Okay, Rick? Here we go. Chin down just a little. I'll do the same thing and just compare. Yeah, so that's a big difference from from the first one to the second one, there's a big difference there with, on the shadow. But the main thing is what the light quality on the face does a really good job. And it's a big enough source that, you know, it's fun too. You can, you know, with, with a light like this, you can move it in, get in really, really close with it. And as you get closer, the edge of the shadow becomes softer. And you can do a lot with that uh, as far as doing light, light quality on the mask of the face, the cheeks, the chin, the nose, the forehead, all those five areas, what we call the mask of the face, just really react nicely to a big soft source. So it's, it's easy and it's, it's almost comfortable to look at. So that's why we do it. Uh, we can flatten it out by bringing it closer to the camera, make it more dramatic by moving it further away from the camera. And let's do that for just one here real quick. I'll move it a little further away and let's just turn you just a little bit more that way, Gabby. That's, that's it. And this time, go ahead and just, yeah, bring your hands up a little bit higher this time. Yep, and just kind of lean forward a bit and just bring your head right around this way and chin down a tiny bit, and your eyes are going to be right about here. Yep, great, hold it right there, I'll hurry. Great, 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 and your eyes right at me for just a second. Perfect. Let's bring that reflector in a little bit, Serena, just a little bit closer. Right there, great, good. That's really nice. Let's just turn your head a little bit further, and this time your eyes right about here in my hand. Right there. Don't move, don't move, don't move. Good one. I'm just going to do one more of those. Right about, come a little bit closer, maybe right about here. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little smile on this one. Come on, you can do it. Gotcha. Great. Okay, good. Got it. Okay, relax for a second. You know, working again, work, working in the studio with a light like this, it, it, you kind of, it kind of rolls into the terminology of uh, what you see is what you get. 
And that's one of the beauties of working with one light in the studio. And I've talked about that before on our one light uh, webinar that we did recently. Uh, I want to encourage you also to look at the, at the left side of your screen, left of the video there, you'll see a uh, chat window. You can click in there and join, the, join in the discussion uh, in, our, in our chat room. And we've got a lot of the folks here at, at uh, Bowen's in there tuning in today. In fact, our own Joe Brady's in there, and Joe was with me all day yesterday doing some of this recording, and he does a ton of webinars. Uh, and so you'll see him in there answering your questions as well as Matt and David and probably Jason's in there and several of the folks here at the team. Uh, but they want to answer all your questions, and then I'll answer some as well. So we'll get all that get all that going. Before we leave this topic of the of the uh, softbox, so I do want to mention a couple of things. You'll notice when I when I had Serena bring in the reflector. Now, let me just talk a little bit about placement of a reflector. Most people just bring a reflector in right next to the face, and that changes the the ratio from a you know what I would call an eight to one or a six to one or a five to one to a two to one or or a four to one ratio, and that's all well and good. Except that where it's placed is really important. For me, I like to bring that reflector forward and not have it side by side next to the subject, but I like to have it in front quite a ways. And the reason for that is I want that reflector to pick up the main light from where it stops, right? So where the, so where the front edge of that shadow begins and then start filling in the shadow as you look around that side of the face. You'll hear the terminology wraparound light. Well, I hate that terminology, and students of mine know that I always like, I hate that term, because light doesn't wrap and light doesn't bend. Uh, but it does make sense that it does appear that the main light does come around to the shadow. But it works best if that reflector is pulled forward, probably even more so than you might be aware. It really does help. And then also I want to mention one other thing. From, from one of our previous webinars, we talked about feathering that single light source, this one soft box, and you can feather it to the background, feather it forward to hit the reflector a little stronger, something like that. Be aware that when you feather that light and when you turn it off access, off of being fully into someone's face, just know that not only are you changing its direction, but you're also sort of changing its size. It's becoming slimmer, more thin as it relates to your subject. You might see, in extreme cases, you might see your shadow edge becoming a little bit sharper. So I just want you to be a little bit careful about that. When you really do use the edge of a, of a softbox, you are making it a little bit smaller. And smaller does equate to harder edge shadows, higher specularity, that sort of thing. So just be aware of it. Uh, but I think it's fun. I think it's helpful. And I think it's nice to be able to have the ability to do that. Now, let's go to the next segment. Uh, this is a fun little piece that we did on working with an Octobank. And, and for me personally, uh, I've never been much of an Octobank user. This year, this is the year of the Octobank for me, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Stay tuned for another three minutes, and I'll be right back, and we'll take some more questions. So the next, the next light shaping tool that I want to talk about is this Octobank. This is a pretty big source, and one that for many, many years I've stayed away from an Octobank, and I'm not quite sure why. I didn't like the octagonal catch lights for years. Well, now I kind of like it, and what I mostly like is the quality of light. Um, it, it becomes a beautiful, big, nice, soft source that does a lot of great things about, you know, on smoothing out skin uh, and evening out the exposure, evening out shadows, smoothing the edge of shadows. And at the same time, it's a big source that will send light all the way to the background as well. So it's kind of a nice look here. I've got it in this position. I've got it pretty close to my camera. And, uh, and again, let's just light up and do a kind of a nice headshot here. And we can even back up and do a three-quarter with Gabby here. So let me get back to my camera. We'll shoot this real quick. I've already tested the exposure to be right at 16, so we got a good sharp, good depth of field on this picture, I think. So let's just do one up kind of close so we can get a good look at this, look at the highlights in the face and see what this thing does. That's really nice. Let me do one more of those. Good, good, good. I'm going to go ahead and move around a little bit further to the side. You stay right where you are, Gabby, and I'm just going to move over a little bit and put this lens right underneath this. So just bring your head to me a little bit further, right there. So now it's a little bit more in line with the nose, and it's a little bit more of a, of a uh, kind of a beauty light. But in this position, with this kind of a light source, I don't really need or require a reflector underneath it. As you can see, let me zoom in a little bit closer on the face. There we go, right in there. It's beautiful, beautiful. And the light quality on the face is really, really nice right there. And I've got a good medium to a light gray background. I've got a white wall that's, you know, 20 feet behind her, 15 feet from behind her. 
and all of a sudden I've got this great light quality on her face. I've got a nice separation between her and the background. Um, and it all just kind of comes together and works because of the size of this source. And again, this is a source that I didn't use for many, many years. And now this year, uh, it's kind of becoming my favorite light. And you'll see, I'll mix in several pictures here shot with the, with the, uh, with the Octobank and you can see how especially the catch light really does spark up the eye and it really does add interest. And, and sometimes the catch light itself can be utilized as a design element in your picture. So it helps to have a light source that makes a real cool reflection in the eye. You know, like I say, the, the Octobank is a, is a very big, nice, forgiving light that does great things for the skin, and that's, and that's the big reason for it. Um, I've come up with a term that I used recently. Um, I call it, <laughs> it's, it's almost like stolen from the old phrase cow tipping. I call it Octobank tipping, um, and that is if I tip my Octobank down slightly, um, I can do a better job of keeping that light from getting too bright on my background. Now, if you really need a little extra light on your background and you're working with an Octobank, tip it up a little bit higher, backwards slightly even. And what you'll see is it'll send a little bit more light sort of channeled over, over the model's head and help light up your background. So it works out pretty well. So, but, but I encourage you to get in there and dig in with these Octobanks. There's a lot of great light quality there and there's a lot of great pictures waiting to be taken with an Octobank, I think. Um, let me just look at some of the questions. One I noticed here, what is the setting of the strobe in the camera? So thanks for the question. And, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't cover that in the video. I meant to cover that. Uh, my camera was 1 one twenty fifth of a second. Uh, ISO was probably 200. It's my standard default setting for my brain. Um, and I was shooting with the softbox. I think I was shooting at f16, uh, maybe 11. But I think probably 16. Metered it with my, my, uh, my best friend, my 758DR Sekonic meter. Uh, and I always put it right at my subject's face and then I turn it right to the main light source. Take a meter reading and exactly what it says is exactly what I do. So that's how the setting was done. Uh, the strobe was probably set on power output, maybe in the middle of the range. This was a, these are 500 watt uh, second lights that I'm utilizing, the 500 R's from Bowen's Gemini series. And uh, I usually am around between two and three in the power setting and they go up to five. Uh, so I don't use all the power very often at all. They're, they're pretty powerful lights, even for only 500 watt seconds. So, but they work really well. Um, one of the other questions is, I wanted to make sure that I covered, somebody said, what focal length was I using? I try to utilize the longest lens I can get my hands on and the longest lens I can get away with based on the space that I have. So that lens I was shooting yesterday was 7200 and I was usually as close to this, uh, the 200 range of that as I could. Now. The reality is this is Hollywood and to create this video, I needed to be a little closer to my model than I might have wanted to be. So I was probably shooting with a little bit of a shorter focal length than I would, would prefer. Probably around 100, 135, maybe 150 even. But for me, I would have backed up further and gone to a 200 if I could have gotten away with it. So if that helps at all, I just think it does a better job on the face. Plus, at the longer the focal length, the more narrow my angle of view Right? And the more narrow the angle of view, the more I can get rid of things like the, um, the, the baseboard trim in the bottom of the, of the wall where the wall meets the floor, things like that. It helps to use a longer lens to keep things in the back under control as well. So I hope that makes sense. Um, a lot of good questions. Um, do I see a big difference with the old Dean Collins starfish compared to the Octobank? <laughs> Great question. And I can't believe somebody knows about that old starfish. Um, yeah, I, uh, I have a little history with that starfish. Um, but yeah, the, I think the, the, they're very, very similar. I think the starfish was a very unique design. Uh, George, George Larson, who designed and developed that, just did a brilliant job on a product that has lasted and proven the test of time. Um, but the Octobank, for me, ha has a much, much cleaner look, I think. I think the catch lights are cleaner. Uh, it just, it's just bright and fresh. It's, it's big, and I like to work them in really close. And uh, I'm just having great luck with it. I, there's subtle, subtle differences, but it's pretty minor, pretty minimal. Um, but I hope that helps. Um, let's move on to, a, let's move away now from the soft boxes, and now we're going to sort of lead into the reflectors uh, area. So let's, let's start off by talking about a beauty dish. We've, we've, I've got a 21-inch uh, silver beauty dish. It's one of my favorite new tools. 
But again, it's really got to be used for the right person and the right subject matter uh, to really come to life and really shine well. Um, so take a look at this and see what you think and uh, throw some more questions our way. we got all the guys in the, in the room answering them, and, uh, and we'll be right back with you. It's about three minutes long. Thanks, everybody. Ah. <laughs> no, the water right by Strawberry Fields, like yeah. right next there yeah. is nice. I we'll, went to, we'll go there. Um, kayak canoeing. Yeah. It's like paddle boat. Sorry, I'm just like, wait, canoe, kayak? No, it's a paddle boat. I was going to say, we weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that picture. That was good. Let's take one more one of those before you move. Bring your hands back up like you have that. Just like, yeah, but, but just kind of relax them like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it, yeah, yeah, don't move. Yeah, don't let move. your fingers come off. Mm -hmm. Now let's move a little bit away from the softbox discussion, and let's talk about reflectors in general. Reflectors in general have a pattern where, whereby light comes out of a reflector head and follows the shape, generally, of the reflector itself. First thing I want to talk about is this beauty dish. Beauty dish is becoming really, really popular, and a lot of you have, you have done testing with beauty dishes and are starting to use them some. They're really fun, but there's a couple of things that are a little bit tricky about a beauty dish. One, and probably the number one thing, is there's a sweet spot. And there's a sweet spot right in the center of that, uh, of that beauty dish. It's really important that you get your client in there. And so what I was just telling Gabby is, back up a couple of steps, kiddo. So if she backs up, she can look into the, into the bell of the, of the beauty dish itself. And I told her just to walk forward until she can see that she's dead center with her face right there. So right there, she's kind of in the sweet spot. As you get to the edge, you still get light quality on the face, but it's a different light quality. Once you're in the center, it's more evenly distributed around the edges, and it comes down in a shaft, almost directional shaft, that's sort of soft, so it's kind of a neat look. We'll use some of this, and then I want to also introduce a, a grid spot. Uh, as, you, as you shoot with a grid, everything is exactly the same, except the fall off starts right about here, and bam, it just starts falling off as, as a natural looking vignette. Uh, and the grid spots are very, very directional, uh, and they're very helpful, and you'll notice a big change with this shot that we're doing with just the beauty dish itself. You're going to see some good exposure on that white wall, which becomes a gray, a medium gray. But once we put the grid on, that, that white wall is going to go black, or very, very close to black. So we'll take a couple of pictures and see how it looks. You just talk. I'm going oh, okay. to focus on it. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, I can see this. Hey, look at that. Great standby. Let's lower this light source. So by lowering it just a few inches. Actually, you stay where you are. I'm just going to get this up slightly. I'm just trying to get, un because of the cut of your hair now, I just want to make sure that I'm underneath the edge of that just a little bit so I get a little bit cleaner, cleaner catch light now. Okay, relax for just a second. You know, again, working with that beauty dish is really, uh, it's sort of an exercise in testing, and you, and you really do need to test it. Uh, while a softbox is a little bit more forgiving in its positioning and placement, if you're off a little bit with a beauty dish, you can get yourself in real trouble real quick. You'll still get light on your subject, but you miss that sweet spot of that beauty dish, and it's pretty important. And, and our model, Gabby, you know, once she got positioned, we have a piece of tape on the ground, and that's where she had to stand. She couldn't move. Um, because that you can't have the freedom to move left and right when you're working with a beauty dish. you got to stay in the right spot there. So um, I did want to mention a couple of things. I think, there's, I think there's good versus evil in working with a beauty dish. I mentioned this earlier, and Joe was just laughing. What do you mean evil? Uh, for me, the good part is, man, when it's in the sweet spot and you've got the right face and the right look and the right clothing and everything's all together, it's a beautiful, beautiful quality of light. When you've got someone with skin that's not quite as great, it's not such, great, uh, it's not such a great way to go. 
what I mean by that is, for example, it is a small source. It, is, it does come out and it spreads and it comes out in a channel of, of sort of focused light. But still, it's a small source. It's not big and it's not forgiving and it does produce shadows that aren't necessarily real soft. The problem with that is if you've got somebody with a lot of wrinkles, uh, you get somebody like this face, you know, this is not the face you want to light with a beauty dish. Uh, it's called a beauty dish for a reason. It's used on beauties. Uh, but the, think, about, think, about, think about a wrinkle. Uh, if someone's got a wrinkle in the face and I say, well, define a wrinkle, what does a wrinkle look like? Somebody would say, well, it's shadows. It creates shadows. Well, it does on a light-skinned subject. But if you've got a dark-skinned subject, those wrinkles appear more like highlights as opposed to shadows. Does that compute? And I think what we need to understand is that that smaller the source is, the harder edge those shadows are, or the brighter and, and more specular those highlights become. So you really do want to make sure that you understand how to control this and how to use it, and choosing the right tool for the right subject. If you've got a weathered old face of, a, of an old Navy sea dog that's in his 90s, and you really want to bring out that, that cragginess in his skin and those, those deep ruts and the, the, a life well lived, and a, do a black and white portrait study of that, that's different. And maybe that would be an optimum situation for a beauty dish or even something smaller. Uh, so there are times when you want to do that. So keep that in mind. Um, I just want to glance at the questions that we have here. Um, someone asked if I, uh, since I can't sometimes turn the power down, do I ever use a variable neutral density filter so I can shoot wide open? It's a great question and the answer is absolutely. Uh, I do keep a 10 stop ND in my bag, uh, which is kind of overkill sometimes. Uh, but I will tell you that, uh, not a variable, but it's a, it's a fixed uh, density of 10 stops. I will tell you that also one of the things that I'll do is I, I can only take my ISO down so far. Um, but there are more and more and more people that are just flipping their color balance to tungsten or incandescent on their cameras and just going to 2.8 and shooting wide open and picking a shutter speed that works. So if you don't want to take the effort to use an ND on your camera, you can shoot with the ambient light, go to 2.8 and find the correct shutter speed. And you can also buy from a variety of different vendors, you can buy gel packs that have neutral density gel filters in the pack. So, you know, 12 inch by 12 inch gel, that's a three stop gel, a three stop ND, and you can tape that over your flash tube and that'll cut down your light as well. So that's a real good tip to use as well. Um, one of the other questions that came in is, um, how do I focus my camera? Am I, using, am I focusing and recomposing? For the most part, I'm not recomposing, but in, with my thumb on the joystick on my 5D Mark III, I'm just moving that focus point around, and I usually will keep my camera stationary, and I'll move that point around until I find the point for focus, and I'm using a back, my back button for focus. Interesting thing I've learned over the years of working with a back focus button is that once you focus it, you can move your camera around, and nothing's going to change or move when you're touching that front button. So it's pretty good and pretty helpful to have that. Back. I like that back focus, and, and it just for me, it seems real fast. So hope that helps. Um, the one, one last thing I'll hit on this, and then we're going to move on. What's the pros and cons of using constant light sources? You know, we used to jokingly say that when people would say, when do you use hot lights and when do you use strobes? And I used to jokingly say with Dean, my friend Dean Collins, well, we always use hot lights in the winter and strobes in the summer. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, you know, to warm up the studio in the winter, you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> the idea is, for me, in the studio, I almost always prefer strobes. There is, a, there is a look, there is a crispness and sharpness to that burst of light that I really can't find when I'm working with continuous lights. And there will be, there'll be people that will jump in here and argue with me on that. Uh, and that's okay. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. But for me, I'm a strobe guy. I'm a studio strobe guy. Uh, although I have been experimenting a lot with continuous light sources, and I'll be doing some things coming up with them. Um, someone also had mentioned uh, a Fresnel light. Will I be utilizing a Fresnel lamp for that old, true Hollywood look? I am so glad you brought that up. I, I want to do an entire webinar just on that look. So I, for that reason, I didn't, use, I didn't include a Fresnel in this webinar. But you can absolutely bet you're going to see a webinar coming up on that. That's a whole hour right there just on a, that Hollywood look. Uh, that Fresnel light, uh, focusable spots, all of that sort of thing. This is, this is pretty, ba pretty, pretty big, I think, and pretty important stuff. Great, great looks that you can get. So, All right, we're going to go back to another little quick video where we're going to add a little, uh, a little help with the, with the beauty dish uh, and separating our subject from the background. 
And uh, we'll talk a little bit further about that when we get past this, this next piece. It's about another three minutes long. And I uh, hope you're enjoying this. I hope it's making sense. Um, I hope some of our team are answering your questions in the chat room. I wish I could see the chat room. I can't. All I get is just a handful of questions. Uh, but hope it's all going well. Thanks for tuning in, folks. And uh, take, a next, take a look at this next segment, and we'll be right back with you in about three minutes or so. Thanks. In the town where I was born, lived a man who sailed the sea. And he told us of a life. Okay, we're rolling. In the land of submarines. So we sailed up in the sun till we found, sorry. You know, when we talk about using the soft box for our main light, whether it's a medium soft box or the big octabank, all of those make really beautiful light sources on the face. Now that we've switched and shot with the beauty dish and we've added the grid to the beauty dish, it totally changes the look of the face. And it, to it totally changes the absolute look of the light, the, the directionality, the shadow edge, all that is all a different world now. But because of the grid, you notice we lost our background completely. So now what we want to do, first things first, is separate her from that background. And the best way that I've found to do that, some people will just use a hair light, a small light source up high and slightly behind. But for me, what I've found to be really useful is using a strip light. So in this case, we've got this 140 strip light bank, basically, that's behind and up high, and it's coming in at about a 45 degree tour with a, a soft egg crate grid. Now the purpose for the grid is real simple, to not flare my lens. That's its only job, is to keep the light contained and keep it from spreading past her head and hitting that lens. Once that happens, I'm out of luck. But this is a real good way of, of separating her from the background and at about a minus one stop below whatever I'm shooting at, I get great separation while still maintaining detail in the highlights. You know, now that we've got this great separation from the hair light, from the, the strip light, I call it maybe the axon or separation light, uh, the only thing that's left to do, I think, for this shot is to do one more light shaper. And in this case, I'm going to go back to the world of reflectors, and I'm going to utilize this little uh, sunlight reflector. This little reflector in the background and tipped down will give me a little bit of a, of a sort of a halo, a kind of an arced light source. Uh, on the ground sort of behind her to just lighten up that background a little bit. I don't want to draw attention away from her with too bright of a background here, but I do need a little bit of separation. I do need a little bit of depth to the picture. And right now the background is completely black because of the grid on the main light. So by adding a little bit of a, 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 gr a reflector, gr uh, reflector without a grid, just tipped down, and you'll see how we place it here, uh, I think it really adds some good separation and gives us a little bit more depth and, and dimension, if you will. Don't move. We're going to do another one of those. Don't move. Don't move. Let me see that again. Do me a favor, uh, Serena, since you're standing by here, mm -hmm. do me a favor and go back there and get out of the frame for just a second. I'm going to shoot two pictures exactly the same, one with and one without that light. Okay. So get out of the frame first and let me shoot one. Okay, so now let me shoot one with her in it. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, now you don't move, dear. No changing of anything. Ready, set. Okay, now turn it off, Serena, but don't move it. Just flip the switch down. And get out of the way. Here we go. Here we go. Same thing. Good. Yeah, so turn it on and step out, and then, I'll, and then I'll call you in. Good, good. One more. One more. Your eyes right in here at me. That's gorgeous. Beautiful. Now, Serena, reach in there and just flip off that light, and let's do one without. And great. Here we go. Don't move. Now you can see we got the exact same picture with and without that background light. Awesome. One more. Beautiful. And just push that right foot out away from you again. Yeah. When you do that, what that does is it just kind of shifts your hips yeah. slightly, and it just looks so great. It's a, powerful it's a power. It's a power thing. Okay. Here we go. Everybody ready? Nobody moves. Nobody moves. Let me shoot one and take a look first off. Okay. Great. Okay. So you ready? So let me shoot the first one, and stay right where you are, Gabby. Don't move. Okay, go ahead and turn it down to power two. And here we go, and here's power two. Good, now turn it down to power one. And here's power one, and nobody moves. Okay, go ahead and turn it off, sorry.
you know, once again, we're, it's, it's sort of a building process, you know, for this picture in, in particular. We've got a beauty dish on the face, then we added the grid, then we added the strip light, then we added the background. So it's just a constant buildup. We had a, an assistant that worked with us for years and years in San Diego named Kevin Scott Schumacher. Kevin's a brilliant photographer in San Diego. And uh, I remember one time he built this very complex picture, and we said, Kevin, how did you figure out this lighting? And he said, uh, one light at a time. You know, so really you do find that main light and you start there and then it's a building process. So each element that you build might require a different light shaping tool. So you just start with one and then you add the next and then you add the next and then you add the next and you start building. It's a, it's a, it's a real simple build up process. Now, let me just talk a little bit real quick about that strip light overhead. One thing about it that's important, a lot of you are studio photographers and you have a hair light overhead and that's fine, but I want you to be real aware of one thing. Anytime you're using a hair light overhead and maybe slightly behind, make sure that that measures with your light meter to be below, like at least a stop or so below whatever you're shooting with your main light. And the reason for that is you can see it still at a minus one, but it'll have detail in the highlight. And sometimes if it gets closer than that minus one, if it's like equal to what you're shooting at, Sometimes those highlights really lose all detail. They just, they're just a little small washout. And in fact, you might have a histogram where that's just pegged all the way against the right edge of your histogram. And that's coming from your hair light. So be a little bit, be a little bit aware of that, at least. If you, you don't have to fix it if you don't want to fix it, but, but just be aware that that's probably where that, that spike is coming from on your, on your histogram. Um, so I always try to go about a minus one. Now, on that arcing background light, uh, that's that that sets a beautiful reflector and and it and I just looked at it and thought the shape of it would be ideal to give me a bit of a curve so I just tipped it down and bounced it I was trying not to bounce it into the floor as much as I'm just trying to bring down the value on the wall and in fact I sh if I'd been smart I would have thrown some black uh, a black panel or something on the ground below it so it's not bouncing off of the floor I don't want to bounce off the floor I just wanted the edge to be uh, light to dark so it worked out pretty well. Um, and I will tell you this, one other little tip about that light on the background. Anytime you have a light on a background of any type, you've got a choice on where you place that. And I will tell you that the closer your light source is to your background, the more rapid the fall off of light, the more rapid the transition. Now again, that's measurable. You can measure that. You can be lazy and stand at your camera with your with your. L758 DR, I can flip this thing to a spot and I can stand next to my camera and I can pop that strobe right behind the subject's head and then I can move over a foot, move over a foot, move over a foot and just keep making my readings from here so I can see what my fall off is. And then I can have uh, Serena move that light further away from the background to more evenly feather it out, uh, smooth it out, make the gradation less or slide it in closer to the wall to get a rap more rapid fall off. Does that make sense? So we got lots of options here, and uh, you know it's funny. It always comes back. It always comes back to my light meter, and everybody that knows me knows I don't go to work without my. This is like being a contractor, and this is my tape measure that's on my hip all day every day. I don't go to work without my light meter, um, in any condition. Um, I wanted to go. I want to answer a couple of these uh, questions that, that came in. These are really good questions. One is if you can't afford all the various light sources, which would you start with for portraits? And if you have a family portrait, would you suggest using two light sources? Well, let me go first. Uh, my first choice would be to buy the biggest softbox you can get your hands on that you can afford because you can always make it smaller by backing it up or blocking off areas of it with black paper or with fabrics. So you can always make it a smaller source, but with a small source, you can't make it bigger. If you, if, if you understand what I mean there. So, so get a pretty good size source if you're only going to get one. Now in terms of doing a family, when you say, you, would, I, would I suggest using two light sources? I wouldn't mind using two light sources, but I want to caution you about one thing. Don't let the two light sources be competing light sources. Light should come from one direction, not two. So the only time I would ever flat light or light something, say, with an umbrella on this side or an umbrella on this side and flat light into something would be if I've got a big group of people. In that case, I'm not too worried about directional light. But if I was doing a family of five in their home or a family of ten in the studio, I might take these two lights and I might rotate them slightly like this to where one's behind camera and I've got one that's going to be directional. I want that light to really clearly come from one direction. That's key in, in a quality portrait. So I've got depth, shape, dimension. 
And all of that's the gun. Uh, those are the, the things that are important in separating you from those people that, that really don't know what they're doing. They're just flat lighting and trying to get a good expression. Expression's great, but you've got to get light quality if you're going to be able to, to be competitive in your, in your area. Um, okay, so let's move on from that because I think we've got most of our questions there caught up. Um, trying to just glance here. Yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm caught up for right now. Let me just say this. This this is the kind of stuff that I love. I, I love digging into these tools, and I will promise you that if you will spend a little bit of time testing all of the light shaping tools you have, most of you have many of these tools that you've never used because you've never taken the time to do any testing. Give yourself a break on a Friday afternoon at two o'clock. Just block off the day and go into the studio by yourself. Turn on some music and just start testing different sources and utilizing them different ways and you're going to find that you'll grow exponentially in your talents and your techniques okay let's kick this out and we're going to go back into the studio again for this last segment i think this is going to be a good segment and uh, you'll enjoy what we're going to do with the background next so stick around for another three or four minutes and i'll be right back with you and we'll sort of wrap this whole thing up in a minute thanks everybody be right back with you you know once we've separated her from the background with the strip light from above and behind um, adding that light back in the background is, gives us great, great depth. And that's part of what we're after here, trying to create depth of three dimensions onto a two-dimensional piece of paper. And so introducing another light back in the background really makes a lot of sense here. And by putting that light back there, we've put it inside one of these 40-degree sunlight reflectors, which is a great head. And when tipped down, and you can see how far I've got it tipped, I've really got it tipped down, I'm just using the top edge to help create a bit of an arc. And that's just giving me some interest. That's all. I just don't want it to be too normal and all evenly lit like a normal high key kind of a background. I want there to be some depth, shape, and dimension in the background just like I do on the face. And so that just gives me the ability to pull that off. These reflector heads of all sizes, we've got that wide angle reflector, uh, the standard reflector with grids, all these, all these different small reflector heads really, really give you a lot of control over your backgrounds as well as your subjects and the final, you know, final look to the main light. But for me, I use them an awful lot for auxiliary lights, and placing light just where I want it and sort of craft the light and shape the light exactly the way I want it. Beautiful. Let's do that one again. Let me just look at that accent light. Yeah. Chin up a tiny bit. Good, good, good. I'm going to close down just a little bit. I think we're a little hot. Much better. Much better. Good. Turn your head this way. Is Rick even here? Is he Guys, coming in today so or what? Me. He's not even here. Okay, okay, ready? Somebody let me know if we can get him on set. <laughs> You know, now that we've lit that background with the, uh, with the sunlight reflector, which is a great source and gives that nice arc, now we've just changed and put a small grid reflector in place. And so we've got a small medium grid. Uh, you know, they kind of come fine, medium, and coarse. You can kind of pick your own grid there. Uh, eighth inch, quarter inch, half inch, whatever the depth is and whatever brand you might be working with. But the main thing is you've usually got three degrees of the grid spots. So here I've got the medium grid and I've got it placed pretty high and kind of sending a little bit of a, of a splash of light as if it's a stage light, a, a kind of a spotlight from stage. Then just to add a little bit of interest, we put a little gel on it and you can see how we picked up that deep rich color from the gel. Now, here's the trick on this, working with gels, and I'll do a whole webinar just on gel colors. The interesting thing about the colors is before you put color on that background, you've got to make sure that there's no ambient light hitting that wall or that background. So in this case, there's a lot of ambient light in this room because of the video production. And we've got a lot of light on me that's a, that's a constant light source. But we had to swivel that away, slightly away from that wall or that color, that richness of color will not work. So, but it works out great and it's a lot of fun and you can see by using these small, small reflector heads, uh, it just gives us a lot of things that we can do with our pictures and we can just have a lot of fun. We can create a lot of different moods and looks. You know, you know, working in the studio like this for me is just fun. And again, it's, it's um, most of us that are photographers, most photographers that I know, we're, we're sort of Peter Pan syndrome. We don't want to ever grow up. And uh, getting into the studio with a model, lots of lights, lots of friends, pizza, and a couple of color gels, <laughs> I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> that's, that's what this is all about for me. And, uh, you know, we have to, I want to make sure that we get the pictures that our clients demand. 
but I don't want to be so serious about it that I'm not enjoying my work. And I think most of you feel the same way. We want to do a good job for our clients, but let's, let's relax and recognize that we're not in the medical community here. We're not curing cancer. We're just taking pictures. So let's keep it under, into perspective a little bit, and let's have some fun and enjoy our work. Uh, but I do want to make sure that I get what I'm supposed to get from my clients. So I do need to, um, you know, it's, uh, Dean Collins used to always say, being professional doesn't mean you're earning money from your field. Professional comes from the word proficient. You're proficient at your craft. And, and to be proficient at your craft, it does often require that you got to do a little bit of testing. Um, let me just wrap up a couple of things about these color gels, and I'm going to get to some more questions. Uh, the gels, first off, any time, and I mentioned this in the, in the piece there, but you want to make sure that there's no ambient light in that room. When you're with everything else firing off, all the lights firing, everything that's going to happen, turn it all off, turn everything on except your background light, and then figure out what your exposure is on your subject, and then take a spot reading off of your background. Just take a reading on the background, take a reading on whatever you're shooting at, your reflective reading off the background should be at least three stops below whatever I'm shooting at. Think about this. A reflective meter only has one brain, and that brain is reflect its value of middle grade, right? Well, three stops below middle grade is black. So whatever I'm shooting at, if I'm shooting at, if I'm shooting at F16, this has to read 5, 6, or below. Does that make sense? Because from 16, we got 11 is one stop, 8 is one stop, 5, 6 is three stops. So three, 5, 6, or below will give me a black wall. Then I can introduce color, and then I get screaming, vibrant, true color of the gel bouncing back and coming back to me without any introduction of white light giving me a, you know, a pastel value of a color. Does that make sense? I hope. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, and, then, and then consider using twin lights. You've got twin lights that you can utilize. Put a grid, you know, spot grid on the upper right corner, maybe one on the left, and use, use complementary colors, a blue and a yellow together. Uh, like the great, uh, some of the great artists have always done. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of options that you can pull there with different tonalities and different colors and create lots of different effects. So that background, that background is a lot of fun to work with, and you can get a lot of stuff. Um, what is the height that it should pay? Uh, what is about the height uh, constraints of a home shooting situation? That is an issue sometimes when you get in somebody's home and you can't get the light as high as you want it because your, bo your box is bouncing and hitting the ceiling. If that's the case, before you bring the family on set, consider taking the softbox off of the light, putting a reflector on, and then aiming the light up into the ceiling as long as the ceiling is white. Get that head about two or three feet away from the ceiling, power your power up a little bit, and bounce it into that ceiling at a 45 so it comes down at the same angle of 45. Check it that way and see if it works. That way it does help because it does still give you the big, large, broad source, but it minimizes the issue of the ceiling height. That's a big issue sometimes. And then the other issue is what is the height that the beauty dish should be? Um, my response is going to make you laugh. It depends on the size of the nose. <laughs> oh, sorry. That cracked me up. Depending on what the shape of my subject's face looks like, the nostrils, the nose, the cheeks, the size of the lips, all of that has to do with it. And I will line my subject up with my beauty dish, and I'll raise and lower, and I'll look to suit my taste. Sometimes I want a little bit of a shadow under here. Sometimes it just doesn't look right, and it might make someone's face look misshapen a little bit. So it kind of depends on truly what it is that you're trying to get out of the picture. But you, you'll never go more than just a few inches up and down from that sweet spot. So look for that sweet spot. It's, it's, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, and then finally, one of the questions was, what, is a, what does a grid look like? Thank you, Joe. There's a grid. <laughs> this, is a, this is a grid that we use on the beauty dish. Let me try to... Yeah, there you go. Now you can see through it. And, and this grid is about an inch deep. So if I turn it, it's kind of hard to see, but you can see there's just a little hole. It's, a, it's, it's called either a grid spot, a spot grid, or a honeycomb, depending on the brand. All it does is it sends light uh, directionally so that instead of that light coming out and just spreading, it just brings it down here so now I can aim it and position it right where I want it to go. And that's, and that's kind of what it's, that's kind of what it's uh, best at doing. So it works pretty well for doing that. Um, I don't know, folks. I, I think this stuff's fun. I hope this format kind of worked for today. Uh, we're thinking about doing some more of these where 
where we shoot little video segments, we bring them back in, we introduce that segment, we talk about them, we can show some product, we can answer some questions, then go back and do another segment. Come back and stay. This will, this will keep us focused on track and keep us focused on that direction. Um, we've got some good ones coming up. We've got some really good ideas coming, so you want to stay tuned for that. Next thing I want to just mention, one last thing, is I'm writing this blog pretty regular now at teambowens.com. So check out our blog. Um, we're trying to keep light, uh, lively conversation there. Uh, you know, I've asked uh, on my personal Facebook page and through some of the other uh, outlets and social media, we keep asking questions over and over. What do you want us to talk about? And so we're trying to write that blog post on things that are relevant to you and the things that you want to hear more of and see more of. Uh, many people have talked about group photography. Great. Next week, you're going to see a blog post all about group pictures and how to light for group, group photography. And you'll see more about that on, a, on an upcoming webinar as well. Uh, so there's a lot of good topics coming. Uh, Joe's got webinars coming up nonstop. Uh, just check the schedule. You'll see, you'll get the emails. If you're on this list, you're going to get the emails about all of our upcoming events. Uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time to, to watch these. We think they're helpful. Um, we're trying not to shove specific products down your throat and make you buy anything, but we want you to know that we feel it important to help, you make, help make you guys better photographers. And if we can help improve technique a little bit, then we've done our job here. So thank you all very much. Thanks to the crew. They do a great job. They work hard at this. And uh, uh, Rick show, when Rick shows up, you know, whenever he does come in to, to shoot, way to go, Rick. Uh, we have fun. Rick's our, our cameraman, our, our tech, tech uh, guru extraordinaire who does a brilliant job and make us look pretty good on these shows and does a great job. And Jen, our producer. Uh, of course, I'm in here with Joe Brady, who's answering many of your questions today, and he does a brilliant job. So thanks, everybody. Thanks to the crew and the, and the, and the Bowen staff that have uh, been in the, in the chat room. Thanks for taking those questions for us and answering some of the tech questions and product questions. Uh, and again, thanks for joining us today. Like I say, if this, is, uh, if this is helpful, let us know. Let us hear from you from time to time. Uh, on behalf of Bowen's and the Mac Group here in the U.S., I appreciate everything. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.